saves us. And everybody said? Amen. Well, man, you can have a seat, and I just have to say this. It is awesome to be home. It is so good to be home. Yeah. Um, man, I, I, uh, I got to go away. I'll, I'll recap for a little bit of, of you guys who maybe haven't been caught up, but man, it is so wonderful to get home. I love to go. I love to see what God is doing, but more than anything, when I get home, I am always reminded about how amazing our God is and how incredibly blessed we are with what we have here. I mean, it is amazing what we have at our disposal, but with all of that, blessing comes incredible responsibility, and I'm just always reminded of that, and we are blessed. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Devin is away on sabbatical. Um, Pastor David is at youth camp, and so is Pastor Juan, and Crystal's on vacation. So last week, they were all here, I was gone, and now they're all gone. So you're left with me, so sorry. So, um, but, um, but, it's, but it's amazing. We are blessed with an amazing staff of people here at our church that allow me to get to go do amazing things literally all over the world, and then when I come home sick, they take care of things, which is, uh, which is a blessing, they take care of me. Um, just a real quick recap, because a lot of people have been asking, um, and for those of you who may be new and don't know, um, I, I got to go for um, a, a couple weeks. I was gone in Africa, um, was in the country of Liberia, and let me just say this, um, it is crazy there. Total chaos, there is no order to the place. Um, they're recovering still from multiple civil wars. It is not what you think of when you think of trip to Africa, get in a Jeep and go see animals. Okay, it is just mayhem, and um, it is it is craziness. Um, but what Stephen and Anna Enoch um, are doing in the middle of all that is this incredible bright light in the middle of the total darkness. Uh, the guy who was driving us back and forth every day, um, he would tell us things every day, different different little things about the country. But one of the things that stood out to me, he says, "You know, we know." that the United States sends millions of dollars to our country every year, but we have no idea what they do with it. They never see it, right? And, and there's this feeling of like depression and like sadness around everything that happens there because there's no order, no systems. There's one stoplight in the whole country and no one pays attention to it, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just that, it's just crazy. But like I said, but what Stephen and Ann are doing with the orphanage, with the multiple churches that they have planted, with the minimal resources that they have, and now with this medical center, it is this incredible light of the gospel in the middle of all of the madness. And here's some really good news. Just found out um, yesterday that just a couple days ago, the first baby was born in the medical center. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah. But then I, late last night, I got a text um, from Stephen, who is the, the leader of the ministry over there, and he said, we're praising God for Newberry Park First Christian Church today. And he says, because last night at 2.30 in the morning, a family brought a little baby into the clinic, and he says, and if we weren't able to be there and able to help them, that child would have surely died. And for me, who gets to just like run to the drugstore and get what I need or go to the doctor, super, I mean, it just absolutely reminds me that folks, we got it made. And that we have been blessed beyond measure and that there's a world out there that is so desperate. But I am so incredibly proud to be part of a church family that cares about what's going on out there and, and who will put forth effort and finances and all kinds of things to help make life possible. And not only to save physical lives, but to spread the gospel. And so just this quick picture, this was like the first day that this place got open, it was just jammed with people. And so God is doing this amazing thing. And I just wanna say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being a church that, that will go out and get our hands dirty with all of this stuff, and, and who will give, and who understands that we've been blessed, why? 
Yeah, to be a blessing. And you guys are certainly being a blessing there. So I could go on and on for hours, but we, we need to get to God's word uh, today. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you're doing. So today, this morning, we're in week eight of our uh, sermon series through the book of Colossians that we're calling Christ Be Magnified. And it, like I said, we are so blessed. Pastor Juan and last week Pastor Devin did an amazing job uh, jumping in. Are, aren't you grateful for them? I mean, they're, they're, yeah, we're so blessed to, to have such a, a great group of people. So, um, but I'm going to go back. In, in week one of this series, what we learned, the main thing that we learned was that Jesus is God, that Jesus was part of creation, that he created everything. Everything was created by him. So everything was created by him. Everybody say everything. Okay, so we know the breadth of this. And then he says, and it was created by him and it was created for him. All right, it, we, we get this all mixed up. We think it was all created for us, but it was actually created for him. Everything that exists was created for him. Some of that has run amok. Most of that has kind of run amok and thinks it's been created for itself. But the reality is it was created for him and to give him glory. All things were made by him and for him. Everything was made to magnify him, to point to him, to give him glory. And last week, Pastor Devin walked us through a passage in the very last verse, which I'm going to kind of make a little segue into today's passage. The very last verse in the passage that we looked at last week says, and whatever, everyone say whatever. Whatever. Okay, that means whatever. That means everything, right? Everything that you do. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So it says, whatever you do, whatever you do, that means everything that you do. Now, I I, I think there's a lot of people, a lot of churchgoers that I know, and they carry around a bunch of buckets, right? They have their work bucket, and then they have their home bucket, and then they have their fun bucket, right? And it's summertime, we hope that we get to use our fun bucket a lot. And, and then there's even a church bucket. And then what we do a lot of the time is we try to take oftentimes differing amounts of Jesus and try to stick them in those different buckets. Okay, like I'm going to take some Jesus and put it in my work bucket, okay? That's on those days that you, you know, you're trying really hard to be a, a, a good Christian at work, right? You try to get some more Jesus in your work bucket. Then you try to get some Jesus in your home bucket, right? Which we're going to talk a lot about today. Um, and so you got to be good to the people who live in your home. Then you try to, th- there are times when you purposefully leave Jesus out of your fun bucket, Right? I mean, but we have all these buckets that we, and then there's a church bucket, and most of Jesus goes in the church bucket, right? And that's, that's kind of how we compartmentalize and divvy up life and try to include our faith in there. But let me suggest this, that that's where we've got this thing so screwed up, that we aren't supposed to try to fit some of Jesus in all of our little buckets. Let me suggest this. Jesus is the bucket, And he's the only bucket you need to carry. And if you carry the Jesus bucket correctly, he will help you carry all the other bits and pieces of life in the proper order and in the proper way, and he will make the burden light. But you have to trust him that he's the bucket. And whatever you do, whatever, whether it's work or school or home or fun or anything else, that Jesus needs to be the central part of that. And when we just simply think we're inviting Jesus into our bucket, then we don't reap all the benefits of what Jesus has in store for us in that area of our life. So then it goes on and says, do it all in his name. Do it all in the name of him. In other words, do this like you're doing it for him. Do it as if you're putting his stamp, his name on it, right? Live life as if he's putting his stamp of approval on it. Um, a, a great illustration that, that you may have heard before, um, the story's told of, of Alexander the Great. 
And Alexander the Great, you know, who was this great conqueror, uh, he was coming in one evening to a, a small town, and as he approached the gate, he noticed a young soldier who had fallen asleep. And this young uh, soldier by the gate of the city fell asleep and was awoken when he heard Alexander's sword coming out of its sheath. And he stared up at the great king, and the great king, Alexander, looks at him, and he said, son, what's your name? And the kid's quaking because he knows that falling asleep at your post is, I mean, the penalty is instant death, right? He's thinking, here's Alexander the Great. He's got his sword drawn. What in the world's going on? And Alexander looks at him and goes, what is your name? And the kid, this young guy is stumbling and fumbling because he's certain he's going to die. And then Alexander yells again, what is your name? And under his breath, the young guy goes, Alexander, sir. And Alexander the Great looks at him, points the sword at him and says, I suggest you either change your actions or change your name. And I think sometimes as followers of Jesus, Jesus is looking at us, right? And we're supposed to have his name written on our lives. And he's looking at us, sometimes he's going, hey, change your actions or change your name, right? Because we're supposed to, like Pastor Devin talked about last week, we don't like get everything changed so we can become a Christian. We are followers of Jesus, and that changes everything. It changes the way that we live. It changes the way that we approach life. And folks, we're called to demonstrate the life and love of Jesus to the world in everything that we do, the way we live our lives, and that magnifies him. It puts the spotlight on him in whatever we do. And this includes our relationships. And this is where we're gonna dive in deep today. Um, and especially our relationships in, in the home. Uh, today's passage is gonna get me probably in a lot of trouble with some of you. And I totally understand that, right? Um, uh, but it's simple to read. I think it's profound and easy to understand. But for whatever reason, we all have a really hard time applying it. And so I'm just gonna dive into it. You're gonna understand what I'm talking about when we read it. So if you've read ahead, you already know, right? If you read ahead, knowing where we were going, you maybe th brought something to throw at me this week. So, um, but don't do that. So I'm gonna invite you to stand, and we're gonna read Colossians chapter three, starting in verse 18 together. Uh, we stand simply because we wanna respect the fact that um, I may have a lot of words this morning, but these are his words, and these are the ones we need to pay attention to. So let's read them together. Um, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Master, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you have a master in heaven. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. Thank you, Father, that you've made it clear to us. But Father, we pray for a divine intervention in our understanding that we pray your Holy Spirit's power to help us understand how to live this out so that we can live in your favor. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you, you, you know, I, I read the very first verse there. Wives, submit to yourselves to your husbands as fitting to the Lord, and already some of you are starting to tense up. <laughs> right? I mean, a lot of you are tensing up. The women are tensing up because you're like, did he really use the S word? <laughs> and the men are tensing up because there's like, oh no, are we really going to go there? Right? Like, th this, could, this could get crazy. And then verse 19 is all about, all about the men, right? But here's the reality. Jesus changes everything. And, and, and if, we're going to, if we're going to be people who change the world with the way that we live, then we need to start with us. We need to start with changing us, and we need to start with that change in our own homes. 
And, and this, this whole thing is a snapshot, this, this passage is a snapshot of the ideal family. Um, I have a snapshot of our family. I think we'll put it up on the screen here. I, I wasn't sure I was gonna do this, but I think, is there a picture up there? Maybe, yeah, so this is our family. Don't they look great? Do you know how hard that was to put together? <laughs> you, you, you have no idea the amount of chaos that ensued right before this picture was taken, right? I mean, look at all those great smiles. Nobody is like poking each other. Um, everybody has all their clothes on. I mean, I'm talking about the little ones, right? I mean, it's just like, you know, and, and, and it's just like, but getting it all together is not easy. Okay, you can take that down. Our family, I love our family. We're far from perfect, but, but we work at it, right? And that's the key. We, we just keep working at it. Uh, and, and, but the reality is, is it takes a lot of work. And I think God knows that, and that's why he's giving us this instruction, because he wants to give us a snapshot of what we're working towards. And, and, and so here's the thing. If, if everything that we do, if whatever we do is supposed to magnify him, if everything that's been created, including marriage and family, was created by him and for him, then we have to learn how to magnify him. And, and so this is something that I don't think that we think about a lot is that our family life, our marriages, our family, our extended family, that is supposed to magnify God. It's, it's not just to be a warm, wonderful, loving place for us to live on a good day, right? It, that, but, but it's supposed to magnify God. The chief end of your relationships, and especially your marriage and family, is to magnify him. And so God wants to tell us how, this is how you do that. That's what, that's what he's saying. This is how you have a life, a marriage, a family, all these things that will magnify him. If you want a different result, do something different. Do what the world tells you to do. But if you want to magnify him, you have to do it his way. And so he starts in verse 18, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting the Lord. And, and then people just sit back and go, ugh, like that's so archaic. Like, right, that, that is so, like, old school. It's like, and then people say, oh, that's cultural. There's a bunch of cultural stuff in there that maybe we don't have to pay attention to today. And I, I would, contend, you know, things have changed since then. I, I, I would contend that things have changed, but not everything has changed for the better. In fact, the places in life where we have grabbed on and say, we're gonna do it this way, or we're gonna make it fit this way, those are the places where things have really gotten jacked up. And I think we have to pay attention. Now, while everybody's even tense about the submit word, let, let me tell you what this uh, verse is not saying. Okay, there's a lot that this verse does not say that we, with the help of the devil, read into this passage, right? Because the devil just wants to stir the pot and make us all, you know, tense. So here's what it's not saying. The first thing that this is not saying is, it is not saying anything to husbands. Okay, the, the, the first thing it's saying, is, it's not saying, is, it's not saying anything to you husbands. In fact, you husbands, this is not a good memory verse for you. Right? He, he's not talking to you, guys. Okay, you, you, this is not a, if you ever quote this verse to your wife, you deserve what's coming next. Okay? Because you're stupid. Right? I mean, this is just, that's just not, this is not what this is here for. If you really pay close attention to this, this is God, okay? This is Jesus talking to, I mean, who, what's the first word there? Right? He's not talking to you guys, he's talking to the wives. So, ladies, he's talking to you, right? Now, now you, you need to look at that and go, okay, God is telling me something here. And, and, and it may be hard. It may be difficult, especially in our time and in our culture and everything else. It may be hard to hear. But we have to ask this question, what is it that God is trying to say to me? Right? Don't hear what the verse is not saying. Because the, 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 the verse is not saying in any way, shape, or form that women are inferior to men. It's not saying that at, at all. That's not true. It's not how we were created. Okay? We were all created with divine 
worth and purpose, and, and there is equality in all of that uh, about how God created us. So there is no inferior, superior, there is none of that. And so don't hear that. But, but what happens is, is the devil loves to play semantic games where he tries to tell you something that's not there. And he tries to get you all angst up Right, so that you don't hear what really is there. That's what, that's what most of the problem is. The other thing that this verse is not saying, it is not saying women should submit to all men. Right? Because, because I mean, when you really take a look at the verse, what, is the, what does the verse say? The, the verse says, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. Okay? Not all the men, just your husband. This is, so he's making this between you and your husband. Not, not everybody else out there, not you against the world, not you against all men and all, you know, bad guys out there and anything else. This is something between you and your husband. So don't, don't be looking further than you need to look at all of this. Because it's, it's not telling you that you have to submit to all men. Just, it's telling you, hey, this is something about the relationship that you have with your husband. And then, what it's not saying also is it doesn't say wives obey your husbands. That's not in here. We, we will use the word obey later when we get to children. That's not the word that's in this verse, right? It doesn't say like you have to just obey and do whatever he says, right? That's not how this is all lined up. That is the, those kind of thoughts are the devil trying to tell you stuff that's not there to get you to push back, right? But what it is telling you is telling you to submit. And oftentimes I think the problem is we don't fully understand what that means. Submitting means Placing yourself, remember, because it says here, it says, wives, submit yourselves. Okay, again, husbands, this isn't to you. It doesn't say, husbands, make sure your wives are submissive. It doesn't say that. It says, wives, you submit yourselves. This is, so what that means is it's a choice, right? It's a choice that comes along with a command that's from God, but it's still like, this is not somebody else, is not something from the outside making you, this is like, this is a choice on your part to take a supporting role in the process, right? This whole idea of submission, we talked about this at length before. Um, the sub means under, mission is like a mission or a plan. So it's to come up under the plan and to undergird the plan together, right? We could go back to Ephesians, that before we get to this part in the book of Ephesians, it says, submit yourselves to one another. There's enough submission for both of you, okay? And in that verse, you can both look at it, okay? Because it's written to both, husbands and wives. It says, submit yourselves to one another, right? Um, out of reverence for Christ. Then he comes back, he's telling wives, hey, submit yourselves to your husband, right? In other words, come alongside, come under gird, and, and, and that is what God's talking about. Um, and many women that, that I've talked to about this who, who get, get upset with this kind of verse, here, here's, here's the thing I want you to think about. That maybe, maybe the problem is you're hearing a subtle voice from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that is saying, did God really say you have to submit to your husband? That, that's kind of what you're hearing. And your immediate reaction is like, no, right? Because none of us are hardwired. None of us, men or women, none of us are hardwired for submission, right? We're hardwired to like get ahead, promote ourselves. And the answer to the question is, did God really say, wives, submit yourselves to your husband? The answer is yes. It's right there in black and white. You know, and you can get mad at me all you want, but I'm just the messenger, Right, I, I, I didn't write this, I'm just, I'm just sharing this with you. And, and people will go, okay, w w but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor, what, what about my rights? I mean, come on, we've come so far, I can't give up my equality, right? That's, I, I mean, I hear this kind of thing all the time. Like, and, and it's the reality, here's the thing, it's the reality that there is equality that actually demands that we have submission. If there wasn't any equality, we wouldn't have to worry about submission. But the fact that there is equality means in some way, place, or for, some way, shape, or form, we have to choose to submit to one another, right? 
And, and so, but here's the thing. When we look at it, we say, oh, like, but what about my equality, right? All my equal rights and my rights and da, 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 all that stuff. Well, well, this is where the Bible, again, it speaks very loudly. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ. We good so far, right? We, so in the way that we relate to one another, we should have the same mindset of Jesus Christ, okay? So we're all good there. But then he says this in verse six, who being in very nature God, we talked about that, that Jesus is God, right? That he's fully God. He created everything. It was created by him and for him, right? So that's who he is. He deserves everything, but it says, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. If there was ever anybody who could have played the equality card, it was Jesus, right? He's God. He could have said, well, all these people down here on earth, man, I created them. I did all this stuff for them, they, they, but they still don't want to listen to me. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours. In other words, he says, hey, all things considered, I don't like this plan that makes me go to the cross, but I'm not considering the fact that I'm God, something to be used to my advantage. If he would have taken his equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage, then you and I might still be on a road destined to hell. Because he would have said, I don't deserve this. I, I don't deserve to be treated like this, and he'd be absolutely right. I, I, I don't deserve to go to the cross for all of these people who have sinned. I don't deserve, why did I have to be the one? Come on, God, why, did, why didn't we figure out how to sacrifice the Holy Spirit? You know? Because come on. Like, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm the son of God. Like, <clears throat> why, did this, why is this happening? Why? Because he understands the power of submission to the Father's will. That even though he is God almighty and all powerful, he submits himself to the will of the Father. And so in our relationships with one another, we should have the same mindset of Jesus that we don't, we don't get all puffed up with our equality or our position. We simply do what Jesus says to do, and guess what? When we do what Jesus says to do, it works. Because remember what we started, and I told you I was gonna hold you to this. Do you believe that what God says in his word is for your good? And you all said yes. You were so naive. <laughs> no, just, yeah, we, we say it till it hurts. And then we're like, oh, I don't know if I really wanna do that, right? If this is an issue for you, right, and, and this can go both ways. If, if, if husbands or wives, if we're having trouble with this mutual um, submission idea, it's because the devil is trying to convince you that you're going to lose something. See, this is what the devil is so tricky about, okay, because you think you're losing something. The, the devil is really good. At, he keeps telling us that God is withholding something from us. He's been, he's been employing the same trick ever since the beginning, right? What did he say to Eve at the tree, right? He says, you won't surely die. God just knows that if you eat that, you're gonna be like him. God's withholding from you. He doesn't want you to be like him or equal to him. So, so he's telling you, no, you can't do that because you're missing out on something. And then we get all like, I'm missing out on something, right? We got FOMO about everything. Yeah, FOMO about sin. Like, everybody else is doing that. I, I, want, I want in. But the reality is, is that, that the devil keeps trying to tell you that you're going to lack something. He keeps saying, oh, this is what God's withholding from you. And he always tells you that you don't have something that you already have been promised in Christ. That th this whole thing, like the devil's saying, hey, you can't, you can't submit because if you submit, you're giving, up, you're giving up something, right? And you're giving up this equality. Well, the equality is something you already have in Christ. 
That means the devil's, saying, the, the devil's trying to say, hey, you're going to lose something, or you never really had something. But Jesus is saying, no, you have it. In fact, it's from that place of strength, it's from that place of all that you have that you surrender. Because, folks, the biggest thing that all of us are going to have to learn, and in all of these things that we're going to talk about in this passage, a lot of it is all about learning how to surrender and learning how to submit to authority. Because guess what? Someday, if you're a follower of Jesus, your ultimate destination is heaven, where you will have to submit to authority forever. Now, to a good God who has your good in mind, right? But you still have to submit to his authority. And so he's going, can you all learn this now? Th that's what this is all about. This is all about a learning process for us. It's not about trying to take something away from you or trying to, in fact, God wants to bless you. For those of you who really have a problem with this, just in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it tells us that God opposes the proud. God opposes those who get puffed up and go, hey, this is, this is mine, I'm in control, you know. And it says, but he shows favor to the humble. So here's the question. Do you want what you think you have coming to you, or do you want God's favor? You pick. If you really want God's favor... If you want all the goodness of God to be piled up, heaped up, lavished on your life, then guess what? Learn what it means to submit. Why? Because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor. And I don't know about you, but it's a lot of work to try to self-promote. Don't you just want his favor? Don't you want him to do what only he can do in your life? Don't you want him to bless you in ways that only he can bless you? If so, do it his way. That's what we're really talking about here. Are you gonna do it his way or are you gonna try to do it your way? The rest of the world's trying to do it their way and they're giving us really bad examples of what it looks like. So as we learn to magnify God, what we're doing is saying, hey, I'm gonna do it God's way and in so doing, it's gonna magnify him. And ladies, I just wanna say this to you. Women, this does not, is not an imposition. This is not something that's put on you as an imposition, but it's an invitation for you to become more like Jesus and bring his favor on your marriage and on your family, right? And that's what God is inviting you into with this verse. He's not saying, okay, I gave you something, now I'm gonna try to take it back. That's not what he's doing. He's saying, I'm inviting you to learn how to get my favor, how to get all of my goodness into your marriage. For, for the people who push back the most on this, I usually wanna look at them and say, <clears throat> have you tried it? I mean, really? Have you, have, have you tried it, really? Or every time that you try it, are you kind of muttering under your breath, like, oh, I don't believe I have to do this, right? If that's what's happening, then you're not really trying it. But do you want God's absolute favor and his lavish gifts to just flow upon you and your family? This is your part in doing that, right? Not because Ken said so, but because it says so in the word. And the words are so simple. It's one verse. I love what God does this. We're gonna do a whole series in, in about a month or so um, just on family matters and relationships and stuff like that, so we're gonna revisit some of this. But come on, this is not hard. God did not give like 50 verses on this. It's one verse. One verse for wives, now one verse for husbands. So switch gears, right? Husbands, wake up, okay? I know I told you those verses, that verse wasn't for you. This one is, okay? Now, same thing goes, ladies. This next verse, not your memory verse, okay? It says this in verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Okay, guys, here it is. God made this so simple for you guys. He knows us. So he made it really simple. He gave you one do and one don't. That's all I gave you, <laughs> right? Let's see if you can not screw this up, all right? One do, one don't. Okay, here's the do. Husbands, love your wives. That's all it says. Husbands, love your wives. 
That's your due, okay? Husbands, love your wives. Now, here's the thing. In the Bible, there's four words. In the New Testament, there's four Greek words for the word love, okay? I, I think what happens is us guys get the wrong word put in there, right? Because there's number one, when it says, husbands, love your wives, okay? The, there's a Greek word, eros, okay? Which is for romantic, erotic love. Unfortunately, most guys think that's the one that's in here. Husbands, love your wives. Sorry. Yes, that's part of the equation, but that's not the word that's used here. Most of the guys I know are going, but I'm trying to give her that, right? And, and I'm like, yeah, but dummy, there's more to this, right? Okay, because that's not the one. So, arrow, right, the next, there's, a, there's another Greek word called storge. Storge love is the love of the familiar. It's the love that says like, like, the storge love is like, those of you who've been married for like 25 years plus, it's just like, you're just together. You can drive in a car for hours and not say a word, and it's good, right? I mean, that's, it's just, it's together. It's just like, it means it's just put together. That's like storge is like the love of the familiar. It's like we just kind of fit. It's like that. That's not even the word that's here, right? The, the sorge love is kind of, some people say it's the familial love, right? It's just like you're stuck with each other. It's like, you know, you do your thing, she does her thing, you know, you, you know, and for guys that usually means I eat dinner every day and I'm happy, right? But it's, that's not how this works, right? So that's not the love that it's talking about here. And then there's the phileo kind of love, and phileo is uh, like, Philadelphia, right, brotherly love, it's this brotherly love, it's like, and, and I know a lot of guys who think that this is the love that they, that they want from their wives, they, they just want a buddy, right? They got out of high school, traded all their buddies in and got a wife. That's what a lot of guys think, all right, it's just my buddy, like she's gonna be, let, let me tell you something, guys, if that's all you think this is, you, 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 that's, that's not gonna work for you for very long, right? Because she's way more than a buddy to you. That's why the right word to put in here is the word agapeo, okay? And it's translated a unique way in the Greek language in this particular verse because it's not only agape, which is unconditional, but it's unconditional and unrelenting. Unconditional, and in other words, it is not a response to what she does, right? It's not, okay, I'm gonna love her if she does what I want. It's not, I'm gonna love her if she shows submission to me. It's not, it's none of that. It's absolutely unconditional and it's unrelenting. It means you don't stop. You keep on loving her with everything you've got. That is what this verse is all about. It means you make the first move. And come on, guys, I, we are horrible at this, right? We'll do something, we don't get the response that we want, and so then we wait. And we're like, she's gonna have to move in my direction before I act lovingly again, right? That's what we do, right? And us guys can get so stubborn and stuck that way. But that's not the kind of love that the Bible's telling us. By, by the love the Bible's telling us is this. You unconditionally, right, no conditions, no strings attached, unrelentingly keep on loving your wives. Now what does that look like, right? What does it look like? Men, your love is, is not just a response, it, it, it's a initiation. Now, how do we do that? I would encourage you guys to make it simple. If you've never read the five love languages, go do that and understand your wife's love language, right? Because that will help you. If you've never read it before, it, they talk about there's, we all have a different language. Unfortunately, we all assume that our spouse has the same love language that we do, and that's usually inaccurate, and that's usually why we get in trouble, right? But like, some, like words of affirmation, um, quality time, uh, physical touch, all these different things, right? Um, I, so so mine, mine is by far words of affirmation and Brenda's is quality time, right? If I assume that Brenda's is words of affirmation like mine, I could say stuff to I'm blue in the face and it won't make a difference. Now, she doesn't mean she doesn't like me saying nice things, but what hers is is quality time, 
right? And this, that means that, and it doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't mean like the last two weeks because we both had COVID and were stuck at home that she was really happy. <laughs> that doesn't count. What, what real quality time is this? I cashed in something else to make quality time. That's what it means, okay? Now, now here's the thing, I, I'll give you guys just a couple things really quick, um, guys, that, that will really help. Number one, uh, one of the greatest ways to show your love for your wife is with your words, all right? Um, I, maybe it's been a long time since you've actually verbally said, I love you, all right? She, she needs to hear that multiple times a day, right? We, we all need that, but especially your wives, they need that. Um, and, and us guys are just not really great at using our words oftentimes. Um, actions. We, we, we need to, by our actions, demonstrate love to our wives. And, and the number one thing I, I, I would say that us guys, I, I, and, and I know I'm preaching to myself right here, is, um, is listen. Uh, listen is probably the most um, underutilized way of showing, um, I know for me, my wife, that I love her, is by just listening uh, listening to understand what's happening in her life, listening to understand what she's going through, her emotions, all those things, just listening. And I have to repent often that my wi- life and everything uh, gets moving so fast that I'm really bad at listening. And I need to take time to listen. It, it, it tells us there, so our, our first thing is, guys, is to love. Um, and, and, and it's so important to love your wives unconditionally and unrelentingly. Then it goes on, our don't. Our don't says, and don't be harsh with them. Um, The word harsh in in this particular verse means abrasive. And guys, you, you, you can get abrasive without knowing it really fast. And so you have to ask this question, okay? There, there is no place, no place whatsoever for abusiveness of any sort or abrasiveness towards our wives. Not verbally, mentally, physically, any of that. There, there is no excuse for that. In 1 Peter 3, 7, it tells us, it says, husbands be considerate. And here's what's interesting in that passage. It says, so that nothing hinders your prayers. You, 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 want, you want God to stop listening to your prayers? Just be a jerk to your wife. Right? If you're, it literally says, be considerate of your wife so that nothing will hinder your prayers. You're like, I thought God always listened to my prayers. He does, unless you're a jerk. And he's like, okay, you go get it right over there first, right? Because God puts a premium on relationships, and especially the marriage relationship because it's something he created. Now, um, so guys, this, what, what that tells us is this. Guys, this is a spiritual matter. It's not just this relational thing that you're trying to figure out. It's a spiritual matter. For you to love and to not be harsh or abrasive, to be considerate of your wife, it's a spiritual matter. Because if you don't do that, then it says that it affects your prayer life. This is a spiritual matter between you and the Lord. So ask yourself this question. Where might I be acting or speaking in ways that are abrasive? Right? Guys, you ask yourself that question. And it's okay for you to ask your wives, hey, are there things that I do that are, are abrasive, right? Now, women, just don't offer this up until he asks, okay? There should be none of this this morning, okay? It's like, just, like, this is not something where, you know, there's lots of stories. I can think of a couple of them in particular um, like um, we're just gonna say Sarah and Abraham, where she thought she was gonna help out, didn't work so good, okay? Wrecked the rest of world history, basically. So don't just offer that up. This is something that you, you, know, that you work out together. And, but husbands, get up the courage to say, hey, what are some ways that maybe I acted or abrasive because I wanna do better at that? That's huge, and that's a great way to show that you're willing also to submit um, uh, to your wives. 
In, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 and 26, um, Paul dives into this even deeper where he says, husbands, love your wives, right? Again, simple. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. So husbands, um, I know a lot of you guys don't necessarily like to take notes, but take notes on this part, okay? Because I'm only gonna give you two questions. Two questions that you should ask regularly, all right? If, if you take seriously this passage in Ephesians. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So question number one, what do I need to give up for my wife? What do I need to give up? I had one guy who oh, I was talking to him about this, and he says, just don't say golf. Just don't say golf. <laughs> so I looked at him, and I said, you just said it, right? It's like, yes, it's golf, right? If you're saying that, then ooh, you know, like, it could be, I, I don't know what it is for you. But here's what I will tell you. Every single guy in here, there's something. There is something. There's something still that you could give up, right? And, and when you're willing to, that will speak volumes. That, that will speak louder than any other thing that you think you ought to do. And Jesus was our example, right? It's like give himself up, give ourselves up, like lay stuff down that we think we deserve or we think we want for the sake of having a great marriage that magnifies him. Right? That's what this is all about. It's not about what I'm going to lose. It's about magnifying God. Question number two is, it says, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word. Second question, guys, is, how can I help make my wife holy? Now, you can't ultimately make her holy, but how can you help her be more like Christ? This is the part where, you know what? I, I, I truly believe that, that most women that I talk to, this is where, man, they, they would love for you to step up, okay, as a spiritual leader who's helping them, right, in their journey of, uh, of, of sanctification and holiness. So the question that you have to ask is this, are you helping her in that process or are you a hindrance to that process? And I just wanna encourage you guys, there's a lot of ways that you can help, help her in her process of holiness. And if you think about those more than you're thinking about all the other stuff, then you are going to have a marriage that magnifies the Lord. I mean, come on, look, we, we, we all, you know, you got married, you thought the goal of marriage was to bring you happiness, maybe, maybe to, you know, have a family or <laughs> other things and have a nice life and all this stuff, but, but that's not it. The main purpose of your marriage, the main purpose of your family is to magnify Jesus Christ. The main goal is to exalt Jesus and to be a demonstration of how God can take two broken, different, unique individuals, meld them into one, and make something beautiful out of that. That is what marriage is really all about. It's not just fulfilling all these things that you think you want. It's about magnifying him because everything was created, including marriage, by him and for him. Now, when you do it his way, the good news is you, you receive his favor and he is going to make it better than you ever could have on your own. There, there's a lot more in this passage that we don't have really time to dive into where, as we get into the, the series in a few more weeks on, on family matters. We're going to dive into this stuff even more. But, you know, it, like we've been talking a lot about husbands and about wives, but it, but it really includes anybody in the family. The next passage is children. Children, it says in verse 20, obey your parents in everything. And the kids are like, everything? And the answer is, Yes, there is no other way to define that word. I can't warp this word in any way that gets us out of everything, right? Trust me, I've tried. But, it's not, and it says why? For this pleases the Lord. So do you want your way or do you want to please Jesus? 
That's the question we have to keep asking. Do I just want it my way, or do I want to live to please Jesus? When I live to please Jesus, he gives you all the, his favor. He gives you all his blessings, which are way better than any of the stuff that you're trying to get on your own. So the question is, will you live to please Jesus? Will you obey him, or will you be left to try to do this on your own? Again, it's a spiritual matter, even for the kids. It says your, your, your obedience or lack thereof is, a direct, is direct, directly related to your obedience to the Lord. In, in Ephesians 6, in Ephesians 6, 1, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, not when they are right, but because that is the right thing to do. And when you do what is right, God blesses. You can either get it your way or you can live to please the Lord. I believe most of, of this, again, is helping us learn how to handle and respect authority because that's what we're called to. Because God is our ultimate authority and we have to listen to him and obey him ultimately. It goes on and it says, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. I just want to throw this one in real quick. When it says fathers there, I think it includes parents. It can include both of you, but, but I'll be real honest. As a dad, uh, us dads, um, I, I don't know about you dads. I, I didn't get, like Brenda got way more of the nurture gene than me. Okay? Um, it's just the way it works. And, and, and so I actually have to think about it a little more, work a little hard at it. Here, here, but I want to give you several ways that you can discourage your children. Right, that you can embitter and discourage your children. Number one, um, lack of affection. Right, um, l- like by never, l- like not not telling your kids um, how much you love them and care for them. Um, you know, I, I th- even appropriate physical touch. Right, they they need that. Um, it, it, boys, I mean, I, I I always as a youth pastor for years. Um, guys who had real issues with the relationships, one of the things, I, I started doing this survey. I know it sounds crazy, but over the years I did this survey and asked the guys who were having real problems later on in life with the relationships, and I said, did you wrestle with your dad? And they all said no. And I was like, you know why? Because there was no kind of fun, kind of rough and tumble, you know, part of that, like just being together. Right? If you don't give that to your kids in droves, if you don't have fun and adventure with them, um, then that will impact the rest of their relationships. And so not showing affection um, w- will discourage your kids. Number one, don't, um, when you don't follow through. When you don't follow through with what you say. And us dads get so busy that oftentimes things get put off. Right? But when you don't follow through, that's an easy way to discourage and embitter your children. Um, don't encourage, but always critique. Right? Us guys always want to fix things, so we're always willing to give, you know, well, this is how you make this better, this is what you do, you know, right? But if you critique and don't encourage, it's a quick way to help embitter your children. And then the other one is don't show up. You, you, guys, I, I, I got to tell you, dads, you, you got to show up. Um, you, you have to make time um, for your kids. Um, and, and so I would say this, bless your children, both husbands and wives, bless your children with your voice, right? The Bible says bless them. Speak God's words over them with your time and with your affection. And, and, and there's a lot more in, in, in this passage. It, it goes on and talks about slaves and how we work and how we have that work relationship, and how, but in everything, in everything, it tells us no matter what we are doing, it says in verse 20, it says verse 23, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord, not human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So when you're, when you're learning to serve in your family, when you're learning to serve one another, when you're learning to obey parents, when you're learning to parent your children, all these things, what is it for? You're doing this as if you're doing it for the Lord. Okay, you're, you're not teaching your kids discipline and all these things so that the annoyance will go away. Okay, or so that you can have a better, it's, 
It's you're doing this for the Lord. And the, the, the real thing that we have to get under in our heads is this, is the way we do relationships as followers of Jesus, the main purpose is not just our happiness. The main purpose is to bring glory to the Lord. So in everything, whatever you do in your relationships, you have to ask that question. How is our relationship glorifying the Father? Because it was all created by him, it was all created for him. And he gave, he gave his life, he showed us the ultimate expression of what it means to submit to the Father's will and to give his life so that we could have life everlasting. And that's why every week, one of the central things that we do is we take communion here each week, right? And the reason that we do um, is not, you know, just because it's a habit or something we have to do every week. This is because at the center of everything that we do, that whatever we do, we recognize that he went first. He went first. He sacrificed first. He gave his life first so that he could demonstrate to us, okay, that submission is a God thing. Submission is a spiritual matter. And I know we talk a lot about husbands and wives, talk a little bit about kids and things like that, but even if, you know, if, if, you, if you're single, it doesn't matter where you're at in the whole thing, learning to submit has value and bring God's, brings God's favor on our lives. And in a world that gets all ramped up and says, no, I deserve this, or no, I should have this, and no, I have to self-promote, and all this other stuff, God is saying, no, you don't need to promote you. You leave that to me. And he demonstrated on the cross that he was willing to do anything to get you everything. And so he gave his life. And that's why each week we, we take communion. The little piece of bread, if you want to take that, and we'll take that, oops, together, maybe. And remember Jesus' broken body that he gave for us. Let's take that together. And then the cup that represents Jesus' shed blood. Let's take that together as well, remembering that he shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And you know, I'm keenly aware that every time we have these conversations about family and husbands and wives and marriage and stuff, that, that there's people out there that, that have a lot of pain and hurt. There's a lot of struggle that goes on in our relationships. So I want to encourage you this morning to, to really seek the Lord. You know, if, if, if you're young and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get married someday, then take lots of notes and get it right the first time. Right? If you're in a place where, man, you're really struggling, then know that there's a God there that wants the best for you. That God has a plan and a purpose. And that God wants to bless you in your relationships. And if you're hurting right now, then I just wanna encourage you this morning, then come and pray. I'm gonna ask our elders to just come up front and our prayer team, or you can grab any of these people with blue welcome shirts on, they'd love to pray with you but some of our prayer team will go to the back corners. And if you need prayer this morning, especially in areas of relationships, I just wanna encourage you this morning, don't don't walk away just trying to juggle that and handle that on your own. Come and let people just pray over you, right? Because the one thing about being part of the family of God is this, whatever you're walking through, you're not walking through it alone. He is there for you. We are here with you, and we want you to know that God loves you so much and that he wants the best for your relationships. So we're gonna pray right now, and then we're gonna sing, and as we're singing, if you want some prayer, just come forward or head to the back, and we'd love to pray for you this morning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, oh, Lord, it's not always easy, Father, but we know that, Lord God, your desire for us is that we would experience uh, true relationships. Father, uh, relationships that are healthy and good and and life-giving. 
But Father, we know that these are places where the evil one quickly attacks, tries to tear us down and can do so much damage, Father, because we know that there's nothing more wonderful than healthy relationships and there's nothing that causes so more pain than broken ones. And so God, we come to you this morning thanking you that you sacrificed, that Lord Jesus, you submitted yourself to the Father's will, that you didn't consider equality something to be held on to, but God, you gave your life so that we could have a relationship with the Father. And Father, we're so thankful for that. And then Father, we're so thankful today that we know that you want what's best for us. So God, we invite you in. God, we, we invite you into our relationships, Father, and we ask you that in every relationship that we have, that God, you are magnified and lifted up. Teach us our part in that, Lord, so that we can have relationships that exalt Jesus Christ and show this world how true love and relationships is supposed to work. We want your favor and your blessing, Lord. Help us to do it your way, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.